on FM, on your mobile and on digital radio. Proud to serve London for 40 years. This is LBC 97.3. You're listening to an engineering test transmission being made by the Independent Broadcasting Authority. These tests are in preparation for the opening of independent local radio in London this autumn. 417 metres medium wave and 97.3 VHF will carry the new services of the London Broadcasting Company. The tests on VHF are not in stereo, but it's expected that VHF music programmes, when they begin, will include stereo. The announcement in 1973 that legal commercial radio was finally arriving in the UK and that the first station to take to the air would be this one, LBC. <laughs> 1973. LBC. LBC. At 40. At 40. Welcome to LBC. LBC. I'm Clive Bull. In the next hour, LBC at 40. The story of LBC Radio and some of the news events we covered, told by its presenters and reporters over the years. In the last four decades, LBC has grown into a trusted, alternative source for news, views and information in London. LBC has proved we can compete and win a substantial audience for commercial radio. The playing field might be uneven, but we have, over the years, become a credible and award-winning radio station. Now, with over 1.2 million listeners, and our dedicated team of presenters, producers and editors, make us very much the voice of London. So, back to that day in October 1973. It's six o'clock in the morning. Broadcaster and journalist David Jessel was the first voice to be heard on the station. Jessel left the BBC to launch an entirely new broadcasting service. This is London Broadcasting, the news and information voice of independent radio. Welcome to LBC at 6 o'clock, October the 8th. My name's David Jessel, this is The Morning Show, and here's the news. There is a scurrilous rumour that I was physically sick um, just a few seconds before making that momentous announcement. You just knew disaster was looming. We went on the air with three hours stretching in front of us with uh, no producers, no reporters, and uh, I, I tentatively asked um, the bosses, um, how am I going to fill this three hours? And they said, well, you can talk about interesting things that have happened that day. I said, at six o'clock of an October morning, nothing very interesting has happened at all. There hasn't even been a day. The first voice on LBC, David Jessel. In 1973, London was a city where unions ruled the workforce, strikes were commonplace, restrictive practices the norm. The year was about to go out with a whimper, as the three-day week was enforced, the lights went out, and the telly shut down at half-past ten to conserve energy. We went to our beds by torchlight, clutching our transistor radios. The time on London Broadcasting is ten past two. Welcome to At Home. Um, my name is Belle Mooney. With me in the studio is Steve Merrick, as Hello. he is indeed five days a week sitting there loyally while Don't Gilly... Don't say it. <laughs> Don't say it like that. Gillian Strickland and I swap over and go off shopping, but Steve's here five days a week, and I'm here today, and Gillian Strickland's here tomorrow. Well, we've got a good program for you today. We've got a delicious recipe from my own personal private recipe book. It has a Belle Mooney special, like the Scouse recipe I gave you next last week, and it's a really good one today. Uh, we review a new magazine on your bookstalls. We talk about the problem of trying to have a sex life when you're disabled and we've got the first of our regular advice column in which I'll be answering your problems, the problems which you've written into at home. One of the problems when LBC began was that a lot of the presenters who were hired were journalists. We came from magazines and newspapers and so did um, a lot of the editorial staff. Yes. So nobody knew what they were doing, nobody had done this before and there was no training. Bell Mooney. 
The late Adrian Love was one of the first early LBC presenters that actually had some radio presentation experience. I came in here at the suggestion of a friend of mine who would come in on day one as a newsreader. A guy called Paul Ingrams phoned me up and said, get down here, son. Places full of people from Fleet Street were saying things like, what's that funny black thing? It's a microphone. Oh, is it? Oh, gosh. Uh, and he phoned me up and he said, uh, get down here and have a chat. And they offered me an eight-hour phone-in show without an audition. Broadcaster Adrian Love. So what about those first guests on LBC? Well, to begin with, there was the Prime Minister at the time, Edward Heath. The opening today of the London Broadcasting Company's station marks a new departure in British broadcasting. It's the first station of the Independent Broadcasting Authority's local radio service and the first all-news radio station in this country. I'm sure its 24-hour service of news, information and comment is going to be of immediate value to Londoners. Prime Minister Edward Heath's optimism might have been misplaced, at least when it came to the quality of those early guests. Harry Corbett, of Sooty fame, came into the studio on my funny little programme. And uh, if you think about it, as a glove puppet, as a silent creature, um, he's a puppet, but he's a television puppet, isn't mm. he? Because you can't see him. And I kept saying, oh, now, children, um, Sooty is really in the studio. Um, he's here. You can't see it. You know, this is silent. And Harry Corbett's waving the Sooty around, you know? It's your actual, real, yellow Sooty <laughs> who's come into At Home today because it's his 21st birthday. And uh, with him, of course, is Harry Corbett and Marjorie Corbett, too. So, hello, Sooty. Hello, hello, indeed. Hello to you all. Yes, I'm Sooty's daddy. Um, Sooty's got black ears, he's a little teddy bear, but I'm Sooty's daddy, and there's Sooty's mummy here because she's Sue's mummy as well, and uh, we've got Sue as well. She sees uh, yes. sitting right next to me. Sue. Sue, so, uh, say, say hello. Uh, uh, hello, Mr. Corby. <laughs> she lovely She's got low and joy, Sue. She's wonderful. Yeah. So LBC was off to a shaky start. And to begin with, there was very little improvement to the radio station until a new boss, former BBC editor of Radio 4's Today programme, Marshall Stewart, was appointed. I think the immediate impressions that I had was one of enormous confusion, a good deal of disorganisation, uh, but interestingly enough, uh, a very strong sense of enthusiasm and energy and commitment uh, from the start. I think to a certain extent they operated in the way that they knew best and that for many of them was based on newspaper uh, technology, newspaper styles, and uh, that was one of the fundamentals that had to be changed. Stewart brought on board a raft of new presenters, gave the station a new sound and direction. The first to be hired was Douglas Cameron. I think he was uh, looking round for somebody to try and present the uh, morning programme, and in desperation he thought, well, I worked with this fellow <laughs> called Cameron on today, and he wasn't too bad. Why don't I give him a ring? Douglas co-presented AM, LBC's flagship breakfast show, with Bob Holness. The programme had strong editorial content and was a great success. Now it was time to address the problems with the cornerstone of LBC's output, the phone-in, and the arrival of Australian Brian Hayes. Up until the time I came to LBC, the phone-in programme in the morning had been presented by an admirable and respected Fleet Street journalist. That, however, is not the way I saw broadcasting. I saw broadcasting being presented by broadcasting people. Also, one of the biggest names in television across the world, the late David Frost, was hired to bring much-needed gravitas to the station. Here he is talking about that LBC show. Never done a radio current affairs program before. I've never had time, and now LBC has made me an offer I couldn't refuse, you see. So I'm doing it. Basically, current affairs is the underlying theme of the things I most enjoy doing, and so that's why I said yes when the chance came along. Particularly now that the phone situation has been clarified, and you can really have ad-lib dialogues with people. With presenters like David Frost and Brian Hayes, an LBC listener could proffer opinion and be very much part of the debate. They could also do something we take for granted today, challenge the leaders. If it's worth thinking about, it's worth talking about. Call Brian Hayes now, 353-8111. Margaret Thatcher, the leader of the opposition, is with me in the studio. And uh, Patrick, you're next on the line. Hello. Good morning, Mrs. Thatcher. Good morning. Mrs. Thatcher, now one liberty of vital importance to all of us is the common law right of every citizen to decide how to maintain, improve, and protect his own health. I don't accept your premise that it violates any fundamental right. 
Brian Hayes with Margaret Thatcher's very first phone-in. LBC. LBC. At 40. Veteran journalist and broadcaster John Snow, then a rookie reporter with LBC in 1975, was one of the first journalists to use an early mobile phone, a walkie-talkie. We also gave him a bicycle as transport, which meant he could dodge the traffic, slip under the police line and be at the heart of a story. That same year, as the Balkham Street siege came to an end, he was the only reporter able to broadcast live that dramatic event. What was amazing was, because we were stranded in the street and everybody else could afford to be in flats all over the place, sort of rented out from people, they were all living the life of Riley, drinking themselves stupid, but we were stuck in the street watching the actual balcony of the flat. And of course, at that great moment when they were freed by the Met, we were there live, but it was an emotional and amazing, amazing moment. It was so dramatic. It's over. The four gunmen have come out. The uh, siege here has just ended one minute ago. There is still um, a great deal of activity here, but a flashing blue lighted van has just swept off into the distance with its uh, a siren wailing. Then suddenly we saw the four being led across the street into the van. LBC reporter now with Channel 4 News, John Snow. Thanks to improved technology, by the late 70s, LBC could broadcast live from events. In 1976, a special Brian Hayes show came direct from Heathrow as the first commercial flight of Concord took to the air. He's gathering speed, gathering speed, there she goes, fantastic ride, she's heaving herself off the ground, up, up she goes. But, in contrast to the success of LBC, the country by the late 70s was spiralling into chaos. It's 1978. Labour Prime Minister Jim Callaghan's winter of discontent had arrived. London was a bleak place to live. The bin men were on strike, rubbish piled high up in the street. Numerous strikes occurred. Even gravediggers refused to bury the dead. The country was on its knees and looking for change. That change came just a year later, when we elected the country's first female Prime Minister. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. And to all the British people, howsoever they voted, may I say this, may we get together and strive to serve and strengthen the country of which we are so proud to be a part. And there was more change in the air. Still to come, LBC dramatically comes of age. More incoming gunfire from Argentine batteries around Stanley. Go ahead. Everything now landing far too close for comfort. LBC. LBC. At 40. 40. LBC. LBC. At 40. I'm Clive Bull with a history of LBC. Still to come, fire on the underground. As our tube train pulled into King's Cross, passengers were ordered not to get off until the next stop. An explosive end to a siege. Quick! Come to me! And the hurricane that took LBC off the air. LBC. LBC. At 40. The 1980s. A new decade, a new Prime Minister, and an event that would test Margaret Thatcher's Iron Lady resolve and create a turning point in the way LBC covered breaking news. This is LBC, where news comes first. Britain is at war with Argentina over the Falkland Islands. In the House of Commons, Foreign Secretary Lord Carrington has confirmed that Port Stanley is now occupied by Argentine military forces. LBC keeps you informed on the Falklands crisis, the big developments as soon as they happen. And I've just been handed more on the Falklands. The Ministry of Defence... A Royal Navy ship fired shells during the night at a surface vessel close to the Falklands. And thoughtful analysis as the options change. This is a situation the government cannot accept. David Spanier at the Foreign Office. The aircraft fire in a later British attack on the airstrip at Port Stanley. Phil Longman, IRN, Buenos Aires. The only thing they ought to 
to do is to get off that island. The Sea Wolf can hit a four and a half inch shell in flight. Paul Maurice, IRN, at the Ministry of Defence. Now everyone is wondering just what happens next. Kim Sabido, IRN, aboard the Canberra in the South Atlantic. It's not just the future of the Falklands at stake, but the future of Mrs Thatcher as well. Peter Allen, IRN, Westminster. LBC on the Falklands crisis. Informed, fast. During the Falklands conflict in 1982, the station used reporters and informed experts to produce the country's first rolling news coverage. It took the BBC by surprise. Former LBC presenter Brian Hayes. It actually made LBC. After all of the struggle over all those yeah. years, the way we were able to cover the Falklands War dazzled everybody. You know, that sounds like an overstatement, but the BBC was very interested indeed in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I know one or two people there in fairly high places who were quite envious of the way we did it. And uniquely, and in a stroke of genius, LBC sent reporters to Argentina. Antonia Higgs in Buenos Aires and reporter Phil Longman. It was quite extraordinary reporting from an enemy capital, as it were. I don't think that had happened before in British history. Um, and we were well received by the Argentine people who generally liked the British and by the Argentine authorities. Um, in fact, the main criticism coming back to us was that we were reporting on what the enemy was saying about the campaign. And we were reporting Argentine claims of um, ships being hit and aircraft being shot down, which didn't go at all, down at all well with uh, Mrs Thatcher's government. We also sent LBC reporter Kim Sabido to join the British troops in the fight for Port Stanley. He risked his life to bring us the dramatic end to the invasion. More incoming gunfire from Argentine batteries around Stanley, keeping everybody's heads down. Somebody's been hit up a front. Good heaven. Everything now landing far too close for comfort. And by contrast, it was reporter Phil Longman who witnessed the end of the Falklands conflict through the eyes of the Argentinians. I think the most memorable moment being out there was standing outside the uh, Pink Palace, the President's Palace in Buenos Aires. Um, and tens and tens of thousands of people banging drums and waiting for President Galtieri to come out. The enthusiasm for the war and for the takeover of the Falklands was tremendous. And the disappointment in the country when the British forces took the honours back was extraordinary. The mood changed overnight when the, uh, the Belgrano, the battleship, was sunk. And I think the Argentine people knew then that the game was up. On the hour, every hour, from LBC. LBC News. Downing Street has announced that Argentine armed forces in the east and west Falklands surrendered at 9 o'clock local time last night. LBC. LBC. At 40. In 2013, we're part of a digital age. 24-hour TV news, Twitter and online newspapers. But in the 1980s, things were very different. It wasn't until the end of that decade that Sky News launched. Television news had to wait for the filmed TV reports to be developed and then played some hours after an event. This meant that LBC had an edge over the other broadcasters. May 1980 and a siege at the Iranian embassy after a group of six men stormed the building and took 26 hostage. Our reporter Malcolm Brabant was covering the story and was there at the moment the siege ended. Quick! Come to me! There have just been three explosions which have ripped through the embassy building. Smoke is wafting over the roofs now, and there are gunmen, and there are policemen on the balcony, on, on the, just over the doorway. They appear to be going in. That was, that came just a short while. And there's gunfire going. One, I just heard one shot. Reporter Malcolm Brabant with live coverage of the Iranian embassy siege. LBC also led the way in using the latest technology. Whilst BBC radio journalists had to struggle with heavy reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, LBC, in contrast, gave each of our reporters lightweight professional cassette machines. It was a November evening in 1987 when reporter Lindsay Taylor was making his way home. 
I was on my way home on the tube and noticed the smell of burning as we approached King's Cross. Once in the station, the carriage doors opened and I could see wisps of smoke. There was no getting off to investigate. Platform staff were rightly preventing people alighting and a couple of passengers were ushered on. As always, I was carrying my work cassette tape recorder with me. It came everywhere, just in case. So without really knowing what was going on, I instinctively hit the record button. At the next stop, Euston Square, I got out and started making my way back to King's Cross, still recording. Fire engines screamed past me as I ran. Smoke was pouring out of the exits, and I knew something was seriously wrong. But at this stage, I could never have imagined what an appalling tragedy this would be and how many of those poor people would fail to make it out alive. The first thing was when I came across an emergency team trying to resuscitate a man. I didn't know it at the time, but this turned out to be firefighter Colin Townsley, who sacrificed his own life in the race to try to save others. Reporter Lindsay Taylor. And in the aftermath of the fire, a public inquiry found that although smoking had been banned on the tube since 1985, it was probably a lighted match from a smoker that caused the wooden escalators to ignite. By 2002, all wooden underground escalators were replaced, smoking was totally banned anywhere on the tube, and safety training was improved. LBC, LBC at 40. I'm Clive Bull. LBC's depth of news coverage over the years owes much to the women reporters and producers that the station employed and still employs. In a time before the Equality Act, LBC encouraged its female employees to be at the heart of the station. As former LBC reporter Martha Carney remembers. There are certainly lots of very impressive women reporters, in particular I think of Antonia Higgs, who was a very brave reporter. She went to cover the Falklands War from Buenos Aires when she was just an early reporter in her 20s and covered some of the big stories of the time, but there was also a Scarlett Maguire, Margaret Gilmore, Judith Dawson, very impressive. She remember the woman who gave me my first job, Vivian Fowle, who was in charge of news information at LBC. She was a, a great encouragement to many of the women who are working there. Former LBC reporter Martha Carney. There's a saying, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. The great storm of 1987 was an ill wind that caused substantial damage in London and claimed the lives of at least 22 people. Much of London suffered power cuts. LBC had a generator to keep the station on the air. This promptly failed, plunging the station into darkness and off the air. Newsreader Douglas Cameron remembers that morning. It transpired that I had to read the news by candlelight. And that's quite difficult, because in those days we used to read the news from sheets of paper, and a sub-editor was holding a candle to one of the stories, and he leant forward too much and set fire to it. And it was a question of finishing the story before the bit of paper went up in flames. So it was a dreadful business. <laughs> The 10 o'clock news, this is Douglas Cameron. Southern England is picking up the pieces after violent gales gusting at more than 100 miles an hour brought devastation across the region. At least six people have died in the storms. All trains have been cancelled on BR's southern and eastern regions. Two ferries have broken free of their moorings and run aground, and houses have collapsed. LBC, LBC at 40. 1989, and the decade ended with the beginning of the fall of communism. First there was Lech Wałęsa and the Solidarity Party in Poland. By November of that year in Berlin, the gates of the wall that split communist east from west were opened. Standing here on the western side of the Brandenburg Gate, there are hundreds of people standing on top of the Berlin Wall. There's a man with a pickaxe fighting his way through the concrete. It's flying off in chips. People are climbing all over the guard towers. People are standing on top of the Berlin Wall. They're laughing and they're crying and they're drinking champagne. I'm Clive Bull. Still to come... A plane, a jet plane, it sounded like, flew over the apartment building that we live in. It sounded very low. LBC was first to break the news of the attack on the Twin Towers in New York and terror on the tube here in London. There was a big hole in the carriage and there was people lying everywhere, covered in blood and people screaming, screaming help. LBC, LBC at 40. At 40. LBC at 40. 
I'm Clive Bull with a history of LBC. Still to come, a coup d'etat in Moscow and a car crash in Paris that would unite a country in grief. In 1990, the community charge replaced the old system of rates. Every adult had to pay towards the cost of their local authority. The charge was known as the poll tax. It was unpopular, and in March 1990, LBC reporter David Piper suddenly found himself amongst the protesters in Trafalgar Square. And the police are coming under attack, and there's a, a bank, I think, over there on fire as well. There are objects coming from all directions at the police who are on horseback at the moment. The scene in the centre of Trafalgar Square is right police up against the crowds. This is getting out of control. There were similar riots around the country, and the national opposition to the community charge contributed to the downfall of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in November 1990. Just before the official announcement that she'd resigned, LBC received a tip-off from Downing Street. Producer Steve Campen. Well, my editor came into the live show and said, I've just received a tip-off from Downing Street that she's gone. Who's gone? And he said, Thatcher. Thatcher has resigned. I remember saying to him, do you trust this source from Downing Street? And he said, yes. We both looked at each other and went, let's run the story. We hastily wrote in pen a news flash for Pete Murray, the presenter, to read out live on air. I personally think that um, if Geoffrey Howe was still sitting at the Foreign Office, none of this would have happened. I've got news for you. I've got news for you that is going to absolutely shatter you, Pat. What's that? Margaret Thatcher has resigned as Prime Minister. Oh, my God. Former LBC presenter Pete Murray. A short chain of command at LBC allowed news stories to be broken and covered often before other media. In August 1991, news that a coup d'etat by members of the Soviet Union government against leader Mikhail Gorbachev broke just a few minutes before the LBC breakfast show was about to go to air with Angela Rippon. We were flying by the seat of our pants for three hours and because it was a short chain of command, we were just literally saying, so-and-so is on the phone now, just go to this one in Washington, go to that one in Westminster, go to this one in New York, go to that one in St. Petersburg. And that was how we did the programme for three hours. Probably three of the most exhilarating hours I have ever spent on air with not a script, just working from gut instinct, doing what broadcasters love to do, which is react to a major story as it's happening, as it's unfolding. And we beat the BBC because their rather ponderous way of producing programmes meant that they had to go through whole committees. They didn't even lead on the story at 6.30. I think it was nearly 7 before they acknowledged that something was actually happening in Russia. LBC. LBC. At 40. A terrible and evil crime took place on the 22nd of April 1993. It became one of the highest profile racial killings in UK history. And as a result, there were profound and cultural changes to racism and the police. Stephen Lawrence was just 18 years old, waiting for a bus in Eltham when he was stabbed to death. A week later, we captured the moving moments when Methodist minister Sheila Foreman held a memorial. There are flowers and there are candles. The flowers remind us of new life. The candles remind us of the light which is needed in this community to dispel the darkness. Racism casts a cloud of darkness over a community. It took a further 19 years to bring the perpetrators to justice. Gary Dobson and David Norris were found guilty of Lawrence's murder in 2012. Norris was sentenced to 14 years and three months, and Dobson 15 years and two months. LBC. LBC. At 40. If there was one news story that demonstrated the intimate relationship between LBC and the listener, it was the events of the night of August the 31st, 1997. This is LBC. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. She was taken to hospital in the early hours of this morning, where surgeons tried for two hours to save her life. Former LBC presenter Douglas Cameron remembers listener reaction to Diana's death. There was just tributes galore, and I don't think we had a hostile call on. Everybody said what a wonderful princess she'd been and how awful it was that she had died. 
and it was so moving. But former LBC court correspondent and by then Princess Diana's press manager, Dickie Arbiter, found the outpouring of grief salacious. Well, there was an outpouring of grief, and anybody coming from an, uh, another planet would look and say, well, what the blazes is going on? Up to a point, it was a bit obscene. I remember well when uh, Prince of Wales came down from Balmoral with uh, Princes William and Harry and they went to have a look at the floral tributes at Kensington Palace. Now there's an old saying in royal circles, you don't wear private grief on a public sleeve. And here were these two boys, young, young lads, their composure was absolutely brilliant. And all around them there were people weeping and wailing. They were noisy. There was something wrong. Yes, by all means mourn. But th the way it was done was a little bit over the top. In contrast, Former LBC presenter Robbie Vincent believes there's a more complex reason for the outpouring of public grief. Diana's death, as sad as it was, was definitely a release for an awful lot of people. Uh, it was a release of individuals from their own sadness that they weren't able in a family situation to necessarily express. LBC, LBC at 40. I'm Clive Bull, looking back at the past 40 years of LBC. Still to come, former LBC presenter Brian Hayes and what the next 40 years might hold for the station. The power of the, the human voice, the ability to tell your story effectively, is the most important thing. And I would hope that that's what people hold on to. And there'll be more about the future of LBC later on. As a new millennium dawned, London celebrated the year 2000 under a glass fibre dome with Her Majesty the Queen. Later that year, on the other side of the Atlantic in the US, a student visa is granted in October to Mohand al Sheri. The following year, in 2001, he would be one of 19 men that brought terror to the US on the 11th of September. LBC New York correspondent Alan Capper lived in Battery Park beside the World Trade Center. Immediately the first plane hit the North Tower, he called the station. When my call came in, I think the feeling was that this was perhaps not a big story because the, the producer at the time said, oh, well, that's interesting, uh, I'll come back to you in about half an hour because clearly the, the thought was, well, this was a light aeroplane that had crashed into the building, so what? Uh, apparently, uh, I screamed down the phone and said, no, put me on now, and the producer did put me on and, and we had the breaking news story ahead of practically everybody else. A plane, a jet plane, it sounded like, flew over the apartment building that we live in. It sounded very low. It was followed immediately after by a very, very loud explosion. Uh, we went to the roof. I can see the World Trade Center now. Uh, I think it hit about 20 stories below the very top. It is a remarkable scene, as we're seeing right now, flames still coming out of the windows, black smoke billowing from what appears to be all sides, uh, obviously uh, windows shattered and steel jutting out. We saw smoke coming out and everybody started running out and we saw the plane on the other side of the building and there was smoke everywhere and people were jumping out the windows. I think it was only at the end of the day when uh, the LBC broadcasting had stopped that the the full personal uh, enormity hit me that uh, New York and Washington had been under attack. Former LBC New York correspondent, now president of the Foreign Press Association, Alan Kappa. In the four terrorist attacks, 2,977 people died, along with 19 hijackers. Still to come, the future of radio. I haven't listened to LBC on FM for about five years now. London celebrates. It's time to forget bankers' bonuses, traffic traumas and faltering finances. The world has come to our great city. The listener becomes the reporter. That helicopter's pretty low, it's just about to hit the tower and as I said that, he hit the crane. And the Deputy Prime Minister gets his own show. Nick Craig, welcome to LBC. 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 At 40. At 40. LBC at 40. I'm Clive Bull with a history of LBC. Still to come, the future of LBC and two mayors and a deputy prime minister. At LBC, we've been on a 40-year journey. The distant days of the typewriter and the thick blue fog of a cigarette-smoked-filled newsroom are now just a memory to be played on a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. 
Changes in technology allow LBC to be smart and clever, and more importantly, you joined us on that journey. From the grey post office telephone in your hallway, to your new smartphone with two HD cameras, hi-fi sound, and ability to send audio and pictures anywhere in the world. This is the incredible 21st century place we live in, where an Arab Spring is witnessed instantly by millions, and those who poison women and children have nowhere to hide anymore. Coming up, a look at the future of LBC and radio in the UK. But first, back to a day when technology failed in London, mobile phone networks crashed, and the city was put into lockdown. It's the 7th of July, 2005, 8.50 in the morning. A train leaves Liverpool Street tube station bound for Aldgate, when suddenly there's an explosion. There's a big hole in the carriage, and there's people lying everywhere, covered in blood, and people screaming, screaming help. Islamist terrorists detonated four bombs on that morning. Mayor Ken Livingstone was quick to react to the carnage and chaos of the day. This city of London is the greatest in the world because everybody lives side by side in harmony. And Londoners will not be divided by this cowardly attack. They will stand together in solidarity around those who have been injured, those who have been bereaved. 52 people were killed and more than 700 injured. In the city, the mobile phone networks crashed as Londoners took to their phones. It was also the day that the citizen journalists took over some of the traditional role of the press. LBC received hundreds of pictures and texts through the day, full of first-hand reports of those terrible events. The way we cover breaking news stories changed that morning. Now, through social media and direct contact, you play an important part in how and what we report on. LBC, LBC at 40. From the London riots in 2011 to the murder of Lee Rigby earlier this year, you're now part of the ears and eyes of a breaking story. During the London riots, over 20,000 of you called LBC in one day. There were pictures, videos and eyewitness reports. Looking out of the bedroom window, you've got the supermarket complex, where you've got Aldi supermarket and fitness first, and I can see massive flames, and the skies are completely bright red. I'm standing literally about five yards away from the police, and I can see the protesters right in front of me. But at the moment, it's getting quite hot. There's uh, a few cars uh, have been set alight. You can see very scary red flames coming above the rooftops. Um, I spent half of my life living there. So to see this unfolding, is very, very scary to me. In January of this year, two people were killed and 12 injured when a helicopter crashed into a crane in South Lambeth. Within seconds, you were phoning in reports. I looked up, and I, as I looked up, I tapped my mate on the shoulder and I said, that helicopter's pretty low, it's just about to hit the tower. And as I said that, it hit the crane. Moments later, video had been uploaded of the event and LBC had retweeted pictures, video and eyewitness reports into our feeds. So what is the future of radio and stations like LBC 97.3? Radio futurologist James Cridland. I don't think that radio itself will change, and I think we might be tuning in on new devices and it might be personalised, and I hope it'll look better, but I think that it's stories and people that make radio stations like LBC really special. I think a, a computer can choose music that I might like to hear, but no computer can actually have that human connection that great speech radio gives you. Former LBC presenter Angela Rippon believes the future success of radio lies in the audience of one. The great thing about radio, the thing that radio has over television, not just that it's less complicated technically, is that when you're speaking, it's like the old Jewish saying, from my lips to God's ear. Um, at the moment, people listening to this program are probably listening to it on their own. So when you refer to the listener, that is the person who is listening to you. When you are speaking, you are actually talking to one person. For veteran broadcaster and former LBC presenter Brian Hayes, it's about what we say and the stories we tell. In the end, the human voice is what is powerful. I remember once somebody saying, some of the best radio you'll ever hear is one man with a microphone telling you a story. The power of the, the human voice, the ability to express your story, the ability to tell your story effectively is the most important thing. 
The Daily Telegraph's radio critic Gillian Reynolds thinks LBC now attracts a much wider and younger audience. When you look at how the audience has stayed loyal, has grown, has changed, has kept pace, your audience isn't only people my age. It's people much younger, enthusiastic, joining in, wanting to be part of a real London conversation. Former LBC reporter and Channel 4 broadcaster John Snow is optimistic about the future of radio. I think the, the amazing thing about the age we live in is that actually radio has been reborn. The power of the podcast, the power of the instant, the power of the availability of radio in the car, on the head, uh, in the office, at home, while you're doing something else, etc. Nobody realised it would sustain, and it has sustained. You know, television has sustained surprisingly, but not as well as radio has. And radio is the ultimate medium. The pictures in radio are far, far better than they are in uh, television. LBC. LBC. At 40. I'm Clive Bull. Our 40-year story is coming to an end, but our journey continues. LBC 97.3 has a growing audience and, in the last year, a display cabinet full of industry awards. We continue to bring you the kind of radio that you want, delivering audiences and revenue. LBC 97.3 breakfast presenter Nick Ferrari. The breadth of resources that we have now as being part of Global Radio, which is obviously a giant commercial radio organisation, is truly fantastic. What I like, though, is still not like the BBC. So it's not like this great lumbering beast that is very difficult to turn. You look at what we achieved as regards London 2012. With the impact that Global has, the sort of coverage we achieved, that is what the company now brings to the table. And, of course, it's not just uh, uh, ordinary people around London that are uh, taking part in your programme. You've got uh, some quite a lot of VIPs involved, haven't you? Oh, you're absolutely right. And if you track back the advent of the big names coming to LBC, well, you've got to look at the first ever Prime Ministerial phone-in with Tony Blair. LBC 97.3. Tony Blair. Right, this is Tony Blair on LBC 97.3. I'm taking your calls, and the next call is from Kate in Holloway, near where I used to live. Hello. Hello. Hi. Right, more of your calls in a moment, and this is after the travel news on LBC 97.3 with Natalie Bailey. I think I've got to say now, thank you very much for listening to my first show on LBC 97.3, and it's been very enjoyable. LBC. LBC. At 40. What we have now, and what I think there's always been a thirst to achieve, and probably has not been achieved until now, is that we are on the big politicians' maps. Uh, you can go back to the interview I did with David Cameron, it was on my breakfast show, that he said that UKIP were all fruitcakes and loonies. And what we have now with Nick Clegg is that not that we were ever illegitimate we weren't that sort of but we are totally legitimized now so when the requests go into whoever it might be cameron william haig it doesn't matter or they go into Miliband and ed balls they know who we are it gets tremendous press pickup i'll say this here and now i think nick clegg is a great bloke i really do if i was trapped in a two-man dinghy with any one of the i'd watch the other two drown happily and i'd pull nick clegg aboard because at least he's fun to talk to and as for Miliband, I, I think I'd jump over myself and just leave him in the dinghy. So you and Nick actually uh, g get on very well? Interesting you, you would say that because you're a radio pro, you've picked up on it, and the listeners have too. They see genuine warmth. And, and let me say this, and, and I, I don't know if I've said this on air, credit to Nick Clegg, credit his people, from the first show all the way through, they've never asked, nor have they ever had sight of any of the questions. Sometimes it's got a bit ugly between the two of us. He would accept it got ugly over where the destination of where his, uh, his first son was going to go. Was he going to go to a fee-paying school? It's got a bit ugly for him about bedroom tax. It's got a bit ugly for him when uh, party members have torn up their membership card on the radio. And then we've had the moments of, well, it's sheer LBC insanity, isn't it? Involving a onesie. Harry in Sheffield. Go ahead, Harry. Uh, are you a man of the people, and have you ever worn a onesie? Have you ever uh, worn a onesie, Deputy I Brooke? was actually given a big green onesie. And, of course, everyone now focuses on Nick Clegg, but it's worth remembering it was on LBC 97.3 that we really put the phone in to the mayor on the map with Ken Livingstone, initially, of course, is one of my colleagues now on the station, and, of course, with Boris Johnson with Ask Boris. Hi folks, it's Boris Johnson here, and I'll be here from 9am next Tuesday morning for Ask Boris. I know that whenever I'm on LBC, I'm standing to attention, and a station that I think is much valued and much loved by people in London. So 40 years of LBC, what about the next 40 years? How do you see the future of talk radio? 
oh, speech radio is going to grow. And I know people have been saying this for a long time, but it absolutely is. Uh, the reason is partly because uh, in this city, an influx, huge influx of people who want to learn the language, and they are naturally drawn to a station such as this. Also, people are coming to the conclusion that modern day politics and politicians have failed to connect so they want to talk to people like you and me where they can have their say and this whole advent of when you watch almost any show now tweet us what you think about this what do you think of, do you agree with what our presenter said call us now take part in our television poll for the love of all that's holy lbc has been doing that for 40 years and here's to the next 40 years when you and i'll be sitting here having a chat again in an old people's home <laughs> <laughs> thank you nick <laughs> This is London Broadcasting, the news and information voice of independent radio. Welcome to LBC at 6 o'clock, October the 8th. My name is David Jessel, this is The Morning Show, and here's the news. The opening today of the London Broadcasting Company's station marks a new departure in British broadcasting. Welcome to LBC. I thought you were looking rather goose pimply this no, morning. No, no, it was very goose pimply. Very goose pimply weather all over. It's over. The four gunmen have come out. The uh, siege here has just ended one minute ago. And she's heaving herself off the ground. Up, up. Welcome to LBC. More incoming gunfire from Argentine batteries around Stanley. Welcome to LBC. Quick! Come to me! There have just been three explosions which have ripped through the embassy building. Smoke is wafting over the roofs now. A plane, a jet plane, it sounded like, flew over the apartment building that we live in. It sounded very low. It was followed immediately after by a very, very loud explosion. There was a big hole in the carriage, and there was people lying everywhere, covered in blood, and people screaming, screaming help. Welcome to LBC. It's time to forget bankers' bonuses, traffic traumas, and faltering finances. The world has come to our great city. Welcome to LBC. Radio History as the first senior member of Cabinet to agree to a weekly phone-in show. Nick Clegg. Welcome to LBC. Welcome to LBC. I know that whenever I'm on LBC, I'm standing to attention. And a station that I think is much valued and much loved by people in London. Proud to serve London for 40 years. This is LBC 97.3. This is London Broadcasting, the news and information voice of independent radio. If you've enjoyed the last hour, there's a great deal more. Longer, uncut interviews with Angela Rippon, John Snow, Brian Hayes, Douglas Cameron, Gillian Reynolds, David Jessel, Dickie Arbiter and many more. Just subscribe to LBC Podcasts by going to lbc.co.uk. I'm Clive Bull. Thank you for listening to LBC 97.3. LBC at 40 was written by Steve Campen. The executive producer was Chris Lowry, and the editor was James Rea. The producers would like to thank Paul Easton and Charlie Rose in the making of this show. LBC LBC at 40